Okay, I think we have critical mass. Um, hi again, everyone. I'm Rachel Baker, Forest Program Director at Washington Environmental Council. Thanks so much to all of you uh, for joining us for the Carbon Conference today and hopefully tomorrow as well. Um, welcome to the closing remarks for today, uh, which are not being given by me, happily. Um, they are pre-recorded remarks from Washington State's Commissioner of Public Lands, Hillary France. Each year, WEC offers space um, in this conference for the commissioner to speak about any topic she feels is timely for the agency um, and related to the themes of the conference. So this year, the remarks you're about to see share the Department of Natural Resources plans and kind of roadmap moving forward related to carbon and climate on the forests and aquatic lands the agency manages. Of course, um, DNR and the Commissioner of Public Lands play such a pivotal role in management of those lands. Uh, and we look forward to an increased emphasis on, on climate and carbon um, as we move forward. So with thanks to the commissioner and the DNR staff for their work, um, we're ready to share that video with you. And we'll see you at 9 a.m. tomorrow for our first panel and throughout the day. Thanks so much. Hello, everyone. It's a great honor to be here. I think we're almost in maybe year six of this. It's great to have this uh, continued partnership and work with Washington Environmental Council and so many other organizations in uh, the Carbon Forest Conference. Um, as the leader of Washington Department of Natural Resources, the Commissioner of Public Lands, I see every day how our lands, waters, and communities are on the front lines of a changing climate. Our climate is changing, has real impacts on real people, whether it's Washington State tribes at risk of losing access to vital cultural resources and indigenous food sources that they've had since time immemorial, or the farmers, orchardists, and vineyards that work our lands and stock our grocery stores with food and support rural economies, losing their crops to drought and even dust storms that we're seeing on our agricultural land or the urban communities suffering from increased incidences of asthma, respiratory disease, and heat domes, which was linked to the lack of tree cover and hotter temperatures that we tragically lost 100 people's lives in Washington State during that heat dome of 2021. Or our forests that year after year are being consumed by drought, disease, insect infestation, or worse, catastrophic wildfire, not just in eastern Washington, but all the way out to the most western point are literally our Olympic rainforest. As the Commissioner of Public Lands, I'm committed to ensuring that the Department of Natural Resources uses every tool at our disposal to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. As climate change continues at a breakneck pace, it is necessary to make the critical investments and policy changes to reduce our carbon emissions and make our lands, waters, and communities more resilient to a rapidly changing climate, not just here today, but 20, 50 years from now. And DNR fortunately is uniquely positioned to be a leader in this burgeoning sector for natural climate solutions because it oversees over 2 million acres of forests, over a million acres of agricultural land, almost 3 million acres of aquatic land, truly are natural climate solutions. So first, we are in the final weeks of completing a carbon playbook for Department of Natural Resources. This carbon playbook will be the first of the, the state, first for the agency. It lays out opportunities to implement and support carbon projects in our state that will provide real and verifiable carbon storage benefits in all our work from our forests and our agricultural lands to our aquatic and even our geological areas. That's right, our five live volcanoes and all of the amazing rock formations and geology that we have uh, in Washington State. These exciting opportunities hold the potential to provide environmental, economic, and social justice benefits for the communities throughout the state in every corner of the state. Second, we recognize the impacts of climate change are already here. So we've taken significant steps through our climate resilience plan to make our state more resilient to our changing climate. And I urge you to check out both our carbon playbook and our climate resilience plan and stay tuned. We're upcoming. We'll have a dashboard for that climate resilience plan, which will help us really sort of track our progress year after year, not just over the next few years, but long into the future. But today we are specifically talking about carbon and our forests. And as we know, Washington State is our evergreen state, but it is facing significant threats from wildfire, forest health, and forest conversion. 
Every year we're reminded by how fragile our forests are, the increasing catastrophic wildfires, the drought and disease that's impacting over 3.3 million acres of forest on the eastern part of our state. And now we're seeing with those late fires we saw in late October and in early November, even fires in the Macaw tribe right before Thanksgiving, our west side forests are in great trouble. At the same time that we're seeing our forests dying or burning, we're also seeing them becoming park it lots and strip malls. The state's population is growing and it's only going to grow more, leading to housing and other development on our previously forested areas. And more people who have financial means are buying second, third homes in our forested areas. And as we saw with COVID, more people would rather live in those forested areas if they can work and play there. As a result, for the first time in history, Washington is no longer 50% forested. And over the next 20 years, we're expected to lose 600,000 acres just to development. We lost 400,000 acres in the last 20 years, and we're now going to lose another 600,000 acres to development. We're truly asking our forests to be all things to all people, a carbon sink, sink for our pollution, our cars, and all of our footprint in the carbon space, to be our building materials for our homes, our schools, and our hospitals, to be our recreation areas for weekend warriors, and to be that critical habitat for threatened and endangered species. Yet we are literally allowing them to be plowed over, to be paved over, and to be burnt down. At the Department of Natural Resources, we are implementing a plan to prevent the evergreen state from truly staying the evergreen tree and not just becoming charcoal black and not becoming car creek gray our keep washington evergreen initiative is both an offense and a defense against climate change specifically the keep washington evergreen blueprint sets forth strategies to increase carbon sequestration in our forest carbon sinks from our forested areas and our built environment while simultaneously defending against wildfire and forest conversion the blueprint consists of a three-part strategy. One, improve forest health to make our forests more resilient in the changing climate. Two, protect and expand our forest land area. And three, promote the use of sustainable locally sourced forest products. Now, achieving these goals to restore, conserve, and reforest the state's forests will not only prevent significant carbon emissions, but it can also actually increase, increase Washington's overall forest cover and therefore remove additional carbon from the atmosphere. We believe our groundbreaking approach will address concerns related to leakage because rather than focus on individual carbon projects, forest carbon projects that may trigger changes in harvesting or supply elsewhere, a statewide increase of forested acres could ensure the reductions in harvest in one area would be offset by new additional working forests in another area. It truly is that triple bottom line, win for the environment, win for our renewable economy, and win for a just society in my mind. So first, strategy number one, we are rapidly improving the health of all our forests. We all know the threat wildfire poses to our forests. Thanks to a history of overzealous fire suppression, our forests are too dense right now, unnaturally dense. As a result, we have too many trees competing for too little water, sun, soil, nutrients. This competition is making our trees weak and susceptible to disease. And older trees have a harder time growing larger and staying healthier as they mature as a result. The result then is forest stripped of their natural wildfire resistance. We truly have powder kegs just waiting for a spark. And we have had plenty of sparks, whether it's lightning or the 80 plus percent of our sparks, which come from humans. And when these forests burn, the result is disastrous, not just in damage to lives and homes and way of life, but also to our air and our water to fish and wildlife habitat, and the release of millions of tons of carbon into the atmosphere. In many years, wildfire lately in Washington state has become the number two source of carbon em emission in Washington, just shy of where we are with transportation, which has been number one. In 2018, we launched our 20 year plan to restore the health of 1.25 million acres of forest, restoring natural wildfire resistance and resilience to our forests. Have, we have an unbelievable team of scientists working on this issue as well as land managers. And fortunately, by the end of this year, 
we will have treated over 400,000 acres of forest on federal, state, tribal, and private land. We are well ahead of schedule and almost halfway to our goal in just five years, clearly well ahead of a 20-year goal. And the pace and scale of this work is unprecedented, but we simply do not have any time to waste. Research is revealing the forest health work we're doing is paying off and reducing these catastrophic wildfires, as well as helping our forests continue to store the carbon for the long run. And we now know we have to turn our work and effort to the west side of the state, as we've seen now 35% of our fires west of the Cascades. And we know it's only growing as time is quickly catching up in the context of climate. The great part of this story is our forest health work not only helps the environment, but it also supports jobs, creates sustainable and affordable building products, and truly, at the end of the day, saves the lives of our community members and our firefighters. Second, we must protect and expand our forest land in Washington State. Like I already said, we are at a deficit. We are already below 50%, and we know how fast that decrease is going to go given population growth, given more and more people wanting to live in the forest and play in the forest. So in addition to our wildfire, we know the forest face these immense threats from development. They have been since I moved to this area in Washington State from my childhood and from college and law school, as I've worked tirelessly to help ensure we keep our forests on our landscape, keep our farmlands on our landscape, um, to truly, in order to truly reverse the trend of conversion of our forests, we have got to set significant ambitious schools and really set forth a strategy and a plan to achieve it, similar to how we did our forest health plan. And we are doing that. We've set an ambitious goal to reforest 1 million acres of forest land and conserve 1 million acres of forest land here in Washington State. This includes replanting in areas that have burned, as well as lands that have laid fallow, but are prime locations for new forests. We're actually forests before we were all walking this earth. So first, post-fire refor reforestation. Millions of acres across one state have been devastated by wildfires in the last several years. It is the agency's preference to replant trees following fires, but this is not always possible. Unfortunately, funding has not always been available. The civil culture program can only afford to provide seedlings and contract workers when there's revenue from a salvaged timber harvest to pay for them. Under some circumstances, a salvage harvest may be ecologically appropriate, viable at the location, and profitable enough to cover these costs, but not always. More commonly, the low commercial value of the burned timber or barriers to accessing the burned area results in thousands of acres across the state not being replanted. Carbon projects are critical opportunities here for us to reforest these areas that were once forested and truly should remain forested. We also know that we don't have enough seedlings available right now, given the amount of areas that have burned, not just in Washington State, but we provide the seedlings, seedlings for many other states, including Oregon to the south of us. We have got to be increasing the number of seedlings available so we can replant those areas and truly make sure that the forest land we had 20 years ago remains forest land, even in the context of wildfire. We also have got to increase our forest land acquisition. We at DNR are seeking to expand tracts that are in danger of future conversion to non-forest land use, because once gone, you can never get them back again. DNR can and believes that it can manage a newly acquired landscape according to sustainable practices and policies that promote carbon storage and provide critical environmental benefits, or could also become community forests or a new land designation, which could enable more flexibility and management options that could enable improved forest management project opportunities and give more local control. We are working tirelessly to expand that forest land acquisition. And we've been seeking funding um, to be able to have a larger budget from the legislature to do so. We are urging the legislature to get behind this work, similar to the, how they got behind the Climate Commitment Act, and truly ensure that we keep the Washington state, the evergreen state. We are also seeking to expand and acquire and, and protect areas adjacent to existing forest land natural area boundaries. So our natural area expansion and restoration. This means incorporating reforestation or afforestation and restoration work, including in riparian areas that the areas had previously, previously been deforested, degraded, or converted out of their natural state. 
Um, this also includes purchasing forest lands and special natural um, areas at risk of conversion, at risk of threat, um, as well as being able to also partner with more of our small forest landowners that are looking to move out of that ownership level um, and need support. We have already conserved hundreds of thousands of acres of forest lands over the past decade, but frankly, it is not enough given the projection to lose another 600,000 acres over the next 20 years. We see the problem. We know the solution. We need to come together to invest in that solution, and we're going to need the legislature's support in doing so. Um, specifically that, we are also looking for different types of funding. Um, and as many of you may be aware, we launched recently our innovative carbon project to protect some of our most ecologically and culturally valuable forests, while still being able to generate millions of dollars in revenue for our schools, our colleges, and our critical local services that state trust land support. This is a new approach the agency has taken. It's first of its kind in the nation. Um, and it's an opportunity for us where we are moving an estimated 10,000 acres of Western Washington's most ecologically, culturally valuable forests into conservation status to store carbon and generate revenue for state trust lands through the sale of those carbon credits. We see an opportunity to be make, getting securing annual lease payments on that from the carbon that is um, being stored as well as the opportunity to continue to make uh, revenue in the forest health work that will be needing to be done to make sure that those areas don't burn up or don't die, which would obviously result in a significant loss of carbon. The carbon project will help us diversify revenue streams and provide financial stability to beneficiaries. We see it as working to ensure that the carbon project is going to meet the highest standard of additionality and durability. And what we've heard is actually it is one of the most significant um, projects of additionality and durability that many in the carbon market finance world have seen. It represents the first in the nation use of carbon markets by a state agency to protect critical forest areas by immediately removing stands from the planned harvest schedule many of which were slated for imminent harvest. And the great part of the story is more than an estimated 900,000 carbon offset credits will be generated from the project in just the first 10 years, which is equivalent to preventing more than 2 billion miles driven by gas powered cars, according to the EPA's greenhouse gas um, equivalencies. The identification of these forest parcels is still going on. Um, and will be included in the project, and it's broken into two phases. So for more information, go to our website at www.dnr.wa.gov backslash carbon project. It's very exciting, and there's lots ahead of us. Um, you're also, I know, focused on all the forests that you can see above ground, but the fact is we have so many forests um, that are actually submerged and don't ever see the light of day, and unfortunately aren't necessarily right in front of us where we can actually see the risk and loss to these forests. We are focused not just on conserving and restoring the forests we have above land, but also our submerged forests. Submerged aquatic forests can actually capture up to 20 times more carbon than terrestrial forests and represent significant opportunities for carbon sequestration projects. As with terrestrial forest conservation areas that protect habitat from anthropogenic disturbances can promote natural carbon sequestration through submerged vegetation growth and sediment storage. But sadly, in the Puget Sound, we've lost over 60% of our submerged forests, 80% in parts of our South Sound. Not all the reasons are clear, but a lot of it comes from our, our urban runoff, the pollution, our sewers, our stormwater, as well as our septics, um, as well as the conversion of those forested natural areas along our shorelines into urban development. So we have set a goal to restore and conserve at least 10,000 acres of kelp forest and eelgrass meadow habitat by 2040. It's the first win of its kind, again, in the Washington state. And in March of 2022, uh, we established through commissioner's order, the first kelp and eelgrass protection zone in the state of Washington. This is near Everett, Washington in the Snohomish watershed, which is this project has laid the foundation for kelp and eelgrass conservation and recovery strategies 
and contributed to 2300 acres towards meeting that 10,000 acre goal. We are looking also into additional um, protection zones that we'll be announcing. But on top of that, we're also looking at blue carbon projects that will work to conserve these important submerged forests that oftentimes don't see the day light of day. And lastly, our third is we must promote the use of sustainable locally sourced forest products. By supporting small forest landowners, supporting local mills and wood manufacturing industries and our larger landowners, investing in nurseries to grow seedlings and using locally sourced wood in our built environment, we can conserve these forests for future generations. The truth is wood is our most renewable, environmentally sustainable building material, especially when compared to concrete or steel. And not a day goes by that not one of us is actually connected to wood as part of our daily life. Growing and harvesting the wood products in Washington is one of the most environmentally sustainable actions we can take. To meet our, our growing housing and climate crisis, we should be growing and harvesting the wood we depend on right here. When we use wood, we actually protect forests that might otherwise be turned into shopping malls and subdivisions. And we reduce the greenhouse gas emissions from transportation as well as concrete and steel manufacturing. Our forests are the key to unlock the solution to many of the most pressing problems facing not just our state and our nation, but also our planet. We have the crisis of climate change driving catastrophic wildfires, floods, and drought, which pollute our air and threaten lives and livelihoods. We have the economic crisis affecting our communities, our, especially our rural communities a lack of stable, good paying jobs, which ripples out into the community, leading to increased crime, drug abuse, addiction, and other social challenges. We also have the affordable housing crisis that has just blown up in the midst of COVID and only gotten worse, not just in our urban areas, but in every corner of our state, including our rural areas. It's forcing people into the streets or unsafe housing situations, piling obstacles onto people who are already hanging on just by just their fingertips. Our forests are truly the answer to creating a sustainable environment, a renewable economy, and a just society that we can all really be proud of, not just for this generation, but for the generations to come. And frankly, more than ever, we need to start seeing the forest for the trees, truly understanding what is threatening our forest survival, what our part is in that. And more than ever, we need to stop fighting over our forests and come together to start fighting for our forests. Truly, it's a some, some more proposition, not a some, some less proposition. We need more forests that provide the clean air and water that we depend on, not less. We need more forests that provide sustainable building materials for affordable homes and apartment buildings and our housing and our schools, not less. We need more forests that store carbon and provide pristine habitats for endangered and threatened species who are even more challenged, not less. All our forests are working on the behalf of our survival. And frankly, it's time for us to work on the behalf of their survival. Now is the moment to change the course we've been on. And now is the moment to change the course our forests have been on. And it's going to take all of us. Thank you. All right, everyone, thanks for sticking around. Uh, thanks to Commissioner Franz for those closing comments. Come on back tomorrow to learn about tribal carbon offsets, extended rotations, climate smart forestry, uh, and climate, or sorry, community forests and climate smart wood. Have a nice night, y'all. <laughs>